Wishing you a happy Thanksgiving and uh, praying for all of us as we're out on the road visiting friends and family. And uh, so hope that you have a good week and I hope you have a great time with uh, the family that you'll be around. You know, um, let you know a little bit about the series that we're in right now. I kind of mentioned it a couple of weeks ago I, when I was in the Middle East. I uh, did a Bible conference on the cross. And uh, so what we've been working through over the last uh, couple of weeks and what we'll uh, finish up with uh, next weekend is uh, some of the selected passages or messages that I, that I used and, and spoke on while I was there in the Middle East. And so it's a little bit different focus than what I normally do on a Sunday morning. It's, it's more of a Bible study, more of a Bible conference uh, than it is uh, the, the typical messages uh, that I use. But I hope that you enjoy it. I hope that it is meaningful to you and I hope it's something that uh, really helps encourage and build you uh, in your faith. We've been, everything is centered around the cross. Uh, we talked last week about the prophecies and about the promises, uh, the things that people knew about Jesus uh, before he was here and before he died. We, a couple of weeks ago, we talked about the cross itself and about Jesus becoming sin on our behalf that we might become uh, the righteousness of God. And today what I want to talk about is this, is I want to talk about day two. I want to talk about Saturday. Uh, between the cross and the resurrection. You know, so often we talk about Friday, and we should, and we certainly talk about Sunday, especially on days like Easter, uh, but rarely, um, I don't think I've ever heard any message or Bible study about Saturday, about what happened on day two. Uh, you know, there's a guy by the name of Voltaire. He's a, he's a French philosopher. He's, you know, lived a long time ago. But he, but he had this quote, and I thought it was really good. He says that we should judge a person by their questions rather than their answers. So is that true? Is it true that you can judge a person better by their questions rather than their answers? It's something you can think about, but if you've ever hired anybody before, you sat down in an interview process with them, everybody's got their interview questions because we want to know about the person. We use those questions to learn a little bit about them. But we always, or I think most times when I do, we finish up that interview process with, do you have any questions for us? I, I don't know if you're like me, but every time I finish up an interview process, if I ask them, do you have any questions, if they look at me and say no, then that's not very good. Uh, because that tells me, or at least this is what I think, they haven't thought much about this. They have no idea, they, they've given it very little consideration what this job is, and, and I just don't know how interested they could be in the job that I've got if they have absolutely no questions for me. Sometimes if you've done interview processes, you've asked your questions, but you learn more by the questions that they ask. Because you really learn more about them if it, children the same way. You know, you ask them questions, they give you answers. Sometimes their answers aren't exactly truthful, Sometimes their answers aren't exactly everything you want to know. They know what you want to know, but they're only going to tell you what you asked. But if you listen to your children and they start asking you questions, it's a window into their heart. It really gives you some insight into what is important to them, kind of what they're thinking about and kind of what's going on inside of, of their soul. So in a lot, it's not that you can't learn things about people from their answers, but you can really learn lots of things from people about the questions that they ask. So here's what I want to do. I want to show you three questions that Jesus asked of his disciples because here's what it does. You learn something, but even more than that, you learn something about Jesus and about what was important to him. So here we go. Here's the first one over Matthew chapter 18. Jesus starts all three of these out the same way. He says, what do you think? If a man, oh, I'm sorry, what do you think, Simon, uh, from whom do kings of the earth take toll or tax? And, and so they're talking about taxes and actually the, the temple tax at this point. Uh, from their sons or from others? Well, I mean, you don't tax your own kids, you tax other people. And so, uh, and when he said from others, Jesus said to him, then the sons are free. However, not to give offense to them, go to the sea, a cast a hook, and take the first fish that comes up. And when you open its mouth, you're going to find a shekel. And then take that and give it to them for me and for yourself. And so he was talking to Simon. They were at the temple. They need to pay the temple tax. And Jesus was basically making the point, listen, we're free. 
you, I don't have to pay a tax because, you know, I'm the Messiah. You don't have to pay a tax because you're with me. And so we, we shouldn't have to pay one. But not to give offense to somebody else, I want you to go cast your hook, take the fish and pull the shekel out. It's one of Jesus' miracles. Give it to them so that you don't cause any offense. And so what was it that Jesus was trying to teach? What he was trying to teach for us is how to balance our freedom that we all enjoy and that we all have and the responsibility we have to other people not to unnecessarily offend them, okay? You know, Paul says, I become all things to all people so that by all means I might win them. And so there's a balance there. I mean, you might be free to go, to do, to watch, to have, you know, whatever, but if you're really concerned about somebody else coming to Christ and coming to faith in him, then there may be some times you don't exercise your freedom because it's more better, more responsible uh, for your neighbor. And so that's one of the lessons that Jesus taught. And what it showed was is that it's important to Christ not to unnecessarily offend other people because we just want to exercise our freedom. Second question is over Matthew 18. Jesus starts off, he says, what do you think? He says, if a man's got a hundred sheep and one of them has gone astray, does he not leave the 99 on the mountains and go in search of the one that's gone away? And if he finds it, truly I say to you, he rejoices over it more than the 99 that went, that never went astray. So it is not the will of my Father who is in heaven that any of these little ones should perish. And so what Jesus is talking about and what he's teaching is the importance of the one. And I'm really glad for that because I'm the one and you're the one too. And so Jesus has this just heart for me and he does for you and he does for all the people who are around us as well. And so he, he asks this question and so what it does and what it reveals about his heart is, is that God loves the one. And he's willing to leave the 99 who don't need to repent, those that are fine and safe and good, to go after that one lady, that one guy, that one child that doesn't yet have a relationship with him. So third question Jesus asks in Matthew chapter 21. He says, what do you think? A man has two sons, and he went to the first, and he said, Son, go and work in the vineyard today. And he answered, I will not. But afterward, he changed his mind, and he went. And then the man goes to his second son, and he says the same thing. And the second son says, I'll go, sir. But he did not go. So Jesus says, which one of these two did the will of the Father? And then the people who he was talking to, they said, well, the first did. The one that said, even though he didn't say, or even though he said that I'm not going to go, the one who did what he was supposed to do, he was the one who did the will of the Father. And so Jesus says, truly I say to you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes, they're going into the kingdom before you. Because they're like the first son. I'm not going to go, but you know what? Changed my mind. I'm going to do what I'm supposed to do. And so what Jesus was teaching in this this parable here is, is, is the importance of not what we promise God, not what we say we will do, not what we tell our mom and our dad and our friends, you know, how we're going to change our life and act and behave better, but what we actually do. You know, it's not necessarily no is the end of the story. Sometimes it's when we go away, we think about the no answer that we think, you know what, I need to change that about me. And, I, and if you go and do what God has called you to, then, then you've been found faithful in the eyes of God, that's the one who is accepted by the Father. And he was saying that the prostitutes and the tax collectors get into heaven before the good people of the city of Jerusalem. So here's my question for this morning that I want us to answer. What happened on Saturday? What, what happened between the cross and the resurrection? And I'll tell you, there's three, it's not three groups of people, but three players in this whole thing. You got this first group of people who are the Sadducees and the Pharisees. You have a second person who is Pilate. And then you have this third group of people who are the disciples. And if you listen to what happens with each of these different groups or person, that what you will find is this, is, is that their response a lot of times are our responses. That how the Pharisees and the Sadducees responded on Saturday you see a lot of people do the same thing. And what Pilate does on Saturday, you find a lot of people in our society still making those same choices. And even how the disciples handle Saturday, early Sunday morning, we've got people in that category as well. So let me walk through this with you and talk about it because Saturday was an important day for us. We talk a lot about Friday. You know, Friday was Jesus is there, he's before Pilate, he's before Herod, he's flogged, he's beaten, they put the purple robe on him, they hit him with a staff, they shove the crown of thorns on top of his head, they haul him off the Calvary, they crucify him there, and he dies on that cross. And, and we should talk about Friday. It's important to talk about his crucifixion. We talk a lot about Sunday. 
you know, where the tomb has been opened up and the stone's been rolled away and there's an angel that's there. And he's saying, he's not here. He's gone before you into Galilee. Go tell the disciples, you guys meeting there. I mean, that, that is an exciting day. Don't start off that way. But it's an exciting day for them on Sunday. But what happens on day two? So here's the thing. In, in all of the scripture, there's about a paragraph that explains a little bit about what happens on Saturday. I want you guys to look at that. It's over Matthew chapter 27, verses 62 through 66. It says the next day, that is, after the day of preparation. So let me give you a little bit of history. The day of preparation is Friday. They're getting ready for the Sabbath, which is Saturday. So the day of preparation is the day that Jesus is crucified on the cross. They're getting ready for Saturday, which is the Sabbath, and it's also Passover. So the next day, that is the day after preparation, that means the on the Sabbath day, the day of Passover, the chief priests and the Pharisees, they gathered before Pilate. It's not where they were supposed to be on the Sabbath day, but that's where they are. And they said, Sir, we remember that that imposter said while he was still alive that after three days I am going to rise. Now let me tell you, that is incredible. Because the Pharisees, the people who crucified Jesus, the one who put him on the cross, they know exactly what it was that Jesus said he was going to do. He said he was going to rise from the dead. They understood it. They're nervous about it. Now what's even more interesting, and later on we're going to look at this, is that the disciples never got it. I mean, they're there at the tomb on Sunday morning thinking to find a dead body inside that tomb. How are we going to get the rock rolled away? Because we want to prepare the body for burial. They never understood, not until after the resurrection and Jesus showed up, that Jesus was going to rise from the dead. But the Pharisees, they're at Pilate's door on Saturday morning saying, this guy said he was going to rise. We've got to get together and do something about this. And so they said, therefore, in order for the tomb to be made secure until the third day, lest his disciples go and steal him away and then tell the people that he has risen from the dead and the last fraud is going to be worse than the first. Pilate said to them, you have a guard of soldiers. Go make it as secure as you can. And so they went and they made the tomb secure by sealing the stone and by setting a guard. And so, what was it that the chief priests and the Sadducees understood? What was it that they did? Because here is this day on Saturday, the Sabbath day, the Passover. I mean, one of the most important Sabbaths of all the year. And here are these guys that are breaking the law because they are so paranoid about the resurrection of Christ because they knew that he said that on the third day he was going to rise from the dead and they're doing everything they can to stop it. The hypocrisy here is just oozing out of what these guys are doing. Because if you remember the life of Jesus and the ministry of Christ, you remember, he was in one of the synagogues one day. And uh, he's reading uh, from the passage Isaiah and there's this guy that's in there that's got a shriveled up hand. And Jesus tells the guy, he's like, reach out your hand. And he reaches out his hand, and Jesus heals this man's hand, and it's restored back to normal. Well, the Pharisees, they were livid. And the reason why they were livid is because they thought that Jesus was, quote, unquote, working on the Sabbath day. And he was like, you guys have totally missed God's point of this day, that it is for good. It is to bless people. I mean, not to just be legalistic about all these rules and regulations that you guys have, but here they are on the Sabbath morning, on the Passover morning, they're going to Pilate, and they're saying, we got to take care of this tomb. I need a guard. I need to have that place sealed up. I need to make sure that nobody's there. We got to get through that third day so that nothing happens to the body of Jesus. And so they seal the tomb. They set the guard. They did everything that they knew that they were going to have to do. And, and here's the thing about the Sadducees and the Pharisees. These two groups didn't get along. They did not like each other at all. The Sadducees, here's what the Bible says about them. They did not believe in the resurrection. They didn't believe in angels, and neither did they believe in spirits. In Acts chapter 23, verse 8, it said, for the Sadducees say that there is no resurrection, nor angel, nor spirit, but the Pharisees acknowledge them all. So do you understand the danger that Jesus posed to the Sadducees? He was about to unravel their entire belief system. There are no Sadducees left, guys. I mean, they're, they're just done. Because if Jesus rose from the dead, everything they taught as truth was wrong. Because they taught there was no resurrection. But then the Pharisees, they acknowledged them all. 
And so what was it about the Pharisees that they didn't want Jesus coming out of the tomb? And I'll tell you why. It's because they were jealous of him. I mean, they were filled with envy and jealousy over Jesus because a lot of their followers, a lot of Jews were following Christ. They're like, man, who else is going to raise the dead? Who else is going to give sight to the blind? Who else is going to make the deaf hear? I mean, who, who's going to do those things? Who else is going to teach with authority like he has? I mean, he's the Messiah. He's the Christ. And so all these people are leaving the Pharisees. They're joining the church down the street, and, and they're jealous of Christ. And so they don't want him out of the grave either. And so they get together. They come to Pilate, and they're like, we've got to do something about this. They are paranoid. They're scared to death of what is about to happen because I think they knew that he was the Christ and he was the Messiah, whether or not they acknowledged it or not. Because think about this, they knew Jesus was dead. They had two of their own people buried him. Joseph of Arimathea, they came, he came to Pilate, he's like, hey, can I have the body? And Pilate was like, eh, you know, is he dead? I don't know. And they sent a guard over there and they put the spear in Jesus' side. He's like, yeah, he's dead, you can have the body. And so Joseph of Arimathea and then Nicodemus joins him and they take the body of Jesus and they prepare it and they put it in that tomb. Here's what it says in John chapter 19. It says, and after these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he may take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate gave him permission to do so. And so he came and took away his body. And then it says, Nicodemus also, who earlier had come to Jesus by night, came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds in weight, which was an exorbitant amount for burial. So they took the body of Jesus and they bound it in linen cloths with the spices, as is the burial custom of the Jews. And now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden. And in the garden was a new tomb in which no one had yet been laid. So because of the Jewish day of preparation, since the tomb was close at hand, they laid Jesus there. They were in a hurry. I don't know if you got that out of all these things, but the Jewish day began when the sun went down. And so on Friday afternoon, Jesus has been crucified. The day of preparation, Friday, is almost over. The, the Passover is about to begin. That starts Friday night when the sun drops down below. And so they're in a hurry. They're like, we got to get the body down because Passover's coming up and we can't defile anything. And so we're going to put this body in this tomb because it's close. And they're going to get it there. And so the, the Pharisees, they had two of their own folks that buried Jesus. They knew the man was dead. And yet they were scared to death. And I want to tell you why. And we're just going to talk about some of the miraculous things that the Pharisees understood. You know, when they had gone out to arrest Jesus, you remember what Peter did? He pulled out his sword and he started swinging. And he swung and he sliced Malchus's ear off, who was the servant of the high priest. Now, the high priest would have heard about this. And so would have all the other Pharisees. Jesus said, enough of that. And he grabbed the ear and he put it back on the man's head and healed him. That's why they're arresting him. They know that Jesus is innocent, and yet they try him anyway, and they shout, crucify him. Let his blood be on our head and on our children's head. They watch him led out to the cross at Calvary. They watch him die on that cross. But there's other things that happen too, that every one of these Pharisees, every one of these Sadducees would have known about. Do you realize that there was a darkness that settled over the land, a supernatural blackness over the entire land from the hour of noon until three o'clock, the hottest, brightest time of the day. And yet while Jesus was on that cross becoming sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God, there was this just pitch blackness over the whole place. In Matthew chapter 27, it says this, from the sixth hour, which is noon, there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour, which is 3 p.m., and then immediately following the death of Jesus, let me, let me read to you what every one of these men would have known happened. It says that Jesus cried out with a loud voice, he yielded up his spirit. And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And the earth shook and the rocks split and the tombs, they were opened. And many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. And when the centurion and those who were with him, keeping watch over Jesus, saw the earthquake and what took place, they were filled with awe and said, truly this was the Son of God. And so here are these guys. 
They have seen the, the deaf hear and the blind see and the dead get up and walk and are raised from the grave. They have seen Malchus's ear put back on this man's head after it had been cut off by Simon Peter. They have seen this darkness, supernatural darkness over the whole face of the earth. They were witnesses. They lived through the earthquake and the rock splitting and the temple curtain being torn from top to bottom. They knew who Jesus was, and yet they hardened their heart. They hardened their heart. Listen to what it says in Matthew chapter 27, verse 63. It says that, sir, we remember that that imposter said while he was alive that after three days, I will rise again. I think they knew it. They knew that he was a Christ. They knew that he was Messiah, and yet they just hardened their hearts, they seared their consciences, and they just pressed on. Let me tell you how we do that, and you'll understand how they did it. There are times that we sin. We know that we've sinned. We know that everybody else around us knows that we've sinned, but we're not going to admit it. We, we just keep right on telling the lie. We just keep right on deceiving. We just keep pushing on because what we think is if we keep lying and we keep pushing forward and we just keep ignoring it, we harden our heart, we don't listen to anybody else that's around us, that Sunday is going to come and it's going to pass and everything's going to be forgotten and we're just going to move right on down the road and we won't have any consequences to our actions. We know, just like the Pharisees, that we're wrong at times, that we've done people wrong, that we've said things that are wrong, that we ought to seek forgiveness, but we just harden our heart and we think, no, I'm not going to do it. And we just go to the tomb, we set a guard, we seal the tomb, and we think, you know what, if I just can just get through Sunday, then it'll be all right. Nobody's going to ask me anything else about it. I'm not going to have to have the conversation. I'm not going to have to go to ask for, you know, forgiveness or repent or confess or do any of those other things again. We just press right on through our sin thinking that it's just going to go away. Let me tell you, Jesus didn't go away and neither are your sins. You're going to have to deal with them either in this life or in the life to come. They're going to have to deal with Jesus on Sunday morning because he's going to rise from that dead. It just because you harden your heart and forget about things and push them out of the back of your mind doesn't mean they're gone. You might be able to work on it and forget about it. You might convince other people not to bring it up anymore. But understand, you can't do that for all of eternity. You will answer. And Jesus will come back from that grave. And he did. And that's what many people in our society do. They just harden their hearts toward Christ. And they just press right on through their sin. And they sear their consciences. And they just pretend like, they're, like Jesus is not going to come back from the grave. But guys, he has. Now, here's the second guy. And that's Pilate. So what do we know about Pilate? And what do we know about what he knew? Because he knew a lot. He knew that Jesus was innocent. He, he tried to release Jesus. He was like, I find no fault in this man. His wife had a dream. I don't know if you remember reading that. Sent word to him and said, don't have anything to do with this righteous guy because he's a good guy and you don't want to make this mistake. Here's what it says in Matthew 27. It says, for he knew, Pilate, that it was out of envy the Pharisees had delivered him up. Besides, while he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent word to him, have nothing to do with that righteous man for I have suffered much because of him today in a dream. He tried to make use of one of the customs that they had, that on the day of Passover that he would release uh, one of the prisoners for the Jews. And he thought, this is a slam dunk. Nobody's going to ask for Barabbas to be released because he's just like this poison in society. And yet that's exactly who they asked for. They asked for Barabbas to be released. He thought, you know what, if I flog Jesus and I just tear him up with this whip, then, then that'll satisfy the Jews. You know, they'll get their blood and they'll be satisfied and then they're going to let Jesus go. But they're like, no, we want him crucified. And so then what does he do? He tries to wash his hands, right? He tries to wash his hands and say, listen, I, I have no guilt in this matter anymore that he's going to be yours. Here's what it says. So when Pilate saw that he was gaining nothing but that a riot was beginning, and if you've ever seen a riot on TV in the Middle East, they're not good. So if a riot was beginning, he took water and he washed his hands before the crowd saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourselves. And so what do we say about Pilate? I mean, really, I think he was just this ultimate politician. Like, I'm not going to get involved in this. This is your religion and your fight. And you guys have these issues amongst yourselves. I'm just going to wash my hands of it and not deal with it anymore. He was trying not to choose, correct? And you think about people in our society today, and, what, and we've probably all been there at some point that we try not 
to choose. We're like, hey, you can have your religion, you can have your God, you can go follow Jesus if you want, but don't put that on me, don't you know, shove that down my throat, don't beat me over the head with your Bible. I mean, we, we, we've all thought those things, and people in our society, they're still there. They're like, hey, you know what? You know, you just go do your own thing. I'm just going to kind of wash my hands of Jesus and cry and be done with him. But, but listen, you can't do that. Because here's the thing about trying not to choose. It's making a choice. It, as soon as you say, well, I'm just not going to choose. I'm just going to remain neutral in this. Listen, you try not to choose, you have already chosen. You've made a choice by not choosing. You, you can't, there's no middle ground with God. It, you're either for him or you are against him. Th there's no in-between with him. And so you can't try and do this pilot thing and think that I'm just going to wash my hands and just kind of be this neutral observer in all of these world events that are happening with Christ and the rest of the things that are happening. You can't do it. You can't wash your hands of him. But some people try, okay? Third group, the disciples. What's going on with them? You know, out of all the people, they're the only ones that were doing what was right. On Luke chapter 23, verses 54 through 56, it says that it was the day of preparation. Okay, that's Friday. And the Sabbath was beginning. That means the night is coming. And the women who had come with him from Galilee, it means come with Jesus from Galilee to the city of Jerusalem, they were following. Now, who they were following was this. They were following Joseph of Arimathea, and they were following Nicodemus, because they wanted to know where they were going to bury Jesus. Because they had every intention of going back, preparing all the burial spices that Jesus needed. It didn't matter that they'd already done it, they are going to do it too. And come back on Sunday morning, if you remember the resurrection on Sunday morning, the women were there, come back on Sunday morning to finish the burial of Christ. So they followed him from Galilee and they saw the tomb and then how his body was laid. Then they returned, they prepared spices and ointments, and on the Sabbath they rested according to the commandment. And so that's what they did. They followed these two guys, they watched where Jesus was buried, they watched how the body was laid, and they went back and they got ready to come back on Sunday morning to finish the burial process of Christ. Now, here's what else we know about the disciples on Saturday. This is what it says in John 20. Then Simon Peter came. Now, he's, he's at the tomb, John's with him, following him. And went into the tomb, and they saw the linen cloths lying there, and the face cloth which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded up in a place all by itself. Listen, if a body had been stolen, it would have been folded up and sitting there, okay? Then the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went in, and he saw and believed, for as yet they did not understand the scripture, that he must rise from the dead, and the disciples went back to their houses. And so you know what that means for the disciples? That Saturday was crushing absolute despair, desperation, hopelessness. Where are we going to go from here? I mean, it, it was every bad negative emotion that you could ever imagine in your life. That's what they felt Saturday night. That's what they felt at this point on Sunday morning because they did not understand that Jesus was going to have to rise from the dead. They didn't get it. They didn't know it. It had not dawned on them yet. And so they were struggling with this thinking that God is gone and it's over with. This man who they believed was Messiah and the man who they believed was a Christ who had done all these miraculous things, he was dead. It was over with. There was no more anything for them. And there are people today who live like that. There are believers who live crushed. There are believers who live in despair. There are believers who live like they're living between the cross and the resurrection like Jesus is still in the grave and he's still dead and he's powerless and he got beat and he got crushed and he got conquered and there's nothing that he can do for them in their life any longer. But you know what? That doesn't have to be the case because the tomb was empty when they got there. And they were thinking that maybe somebody had taken the body because remember the ladies, they came and they're like, man, where's Jesus? We don't know where he is. And they saw Jesus, but they didn't recognize that that's who that was. And they thought that he was the gardener. Remember that story? And they're, they're like, hey, if you put him anywhere, you just tell us where the body is and we're going to go. We're going to get it. We'll take care of him. But please let us know. And, and then Jesus reveals himself to the girls and the ladies and they recognize that it was Christ that had been risen from the, the grave. But, but they didn't get it. They didn't understand it. And so for us, listen, the tomb is empty. It, it, there is victory in Christ. We are more than conquerors through Christ who has died for us. And so just really, just about everybody falls into one of these categories. 
There are people who have, like the Pharisees and the Sadducees, their hearts are hard. They, you know what, if, if they were honest, they would probably say they believe in God. They would probably say that, yeah, Jesus is the Christ and Messiah, but they don't really want to have anything to do with him because it means their life is going to change. It means that they got to change how they think and how they feel and what they do, and they, and they don't want to do those things. So they harden their heart, they sear their conscience, and they just kind of ignore it. They, they, they just hope that they can get through Sunday and there not be any resurrection. And, and then there's those that, that want to try and play good guy and just wash their hands of Jesus and just go, hey, I'm just...